just a, re- restore the norms um, of how we are assuming our technologies are supposed to work and not throw out hundreds of years of the tradition of libraries or personal ownership of our own uh, materials. You know, things that we've read, um, movies that we've seen, records that we've played. Can we go and make it so that we have that norm of, yeah, that's important enough to be in my collection and make that possible as opposed to make everything a kind of rental leasing model where you own nothing. I think just recognizing that um, the way that people consume culture is changing and the way that people can create culture is changing. And rather than trying to cling to these outdated models and this um, concept of false scarcity, we need to just sort of embrace the beauty of a future where all human works of creativity could be accessible to all people um, and where uh, and where people who create things can still be fairly compensated. That's the world we should be fighting for. Forget clinging to the past. Like, let's try to build that future um, where we can have this universal library of human knowledge and creativity um, that the internet could be if we are willing to fight for it and try to shape policies that lead us in that direction. Really excited about this. The artists actually being able to have a platform uh, for the first time to speak directly on these issues to, you know, to their fans and to the, cult and, 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 and to the harms of that culture and to say, Hey, actually, like, this isn't representing me. This isn't serving me. This is actually hurting me. And I want alternatives. And there's been an incredible amount of investment, billions of dollars into this narrative that like these middlemen are defending the interests of artists. I think that what we would want is to definitely not expand the property rights of these gigantic corporations. And I, in saying corporations is kind of an exaggeration because that implies that it's like plural or multiple. I'm talking about like four companies mm-hmm. in most industries, music, publishing, etc. Something that like definitely don't expand their rights. Uh, and then like, think about creating a model that more directly compensates the people who are actually creating the stuff. We're going to bring up the next generation um, based on what they find online. We've got to put the best we have to offer within reach of our kids. Otherwise, they're just going to learn from whatever dreck they can get a hold of. And a lot of the dreck that's out there is paid for, promoted by somebody for some purpose. And we're now seeing state actors um, you know, or political parties going and doing um, you know, billion dollar campaigns to go and change uh, uh, truth um, to uh, go in and mold um, a generation based on free information where um, often the best information is either not online at all um, or if you put it online, they'll sue you. If you go and uh, make it available But the idea that newspapers might collectively bargain is not necessarily terrible and stupid. Um, There is a weird uh, um, kind of feature of contemporary anti-monopoly law that uh, that was ginned up around the same time that deregulation happened that allowed newspapers to consolidate. We shifted from enforcing anti-monopoly law on the basis of a standard called harmful dominance, which basically means exactly what it sounds like. If a company is so big that its dominance is harming people, then we enforce anti-monopoly law against them. And we switched to a standard that was advocated by uh, far-right nutjobs like Robert Bork uh, called the Consumer Welfare Standard. And the Consumer Welfare Standard says that if a monopoly doesn't raise prices, or if you can't show that a monopoly raised prices because it had a monopoly, then you should just leave it alone. And um, the result has been that um, companies that, Uh, merge with one another and then raise prices are generally okay. I think that um, publishers have been trying to figure out for a long time what to do about Amazon, which is their best frenemy. It accounts for about 40% of their sales. And yet um, they know that uh, Amazon plays hardball. At one point when Amazon was launching the Kindle store and trying to convince smaller publishers to get their um, books into the store at very low prices to make it uh, more worthwhile to buy Kindles, They had an internal project they called uh, Project Gazelle. 
and they it was uh the manager of that project said we will identify the um the mid-sized publishers that are vulnerable to us, like the vulnerable gazelle in a pack, and we were in a herd rather, and we will hunt them down like a cheetah and bring them to ground because they're vulnerable to us and we'll force them to do business on our terms. Well, I think there was a moment um in the early 2010s, at least in the United States, and I think it's probably true in Europe as well to some extent, where there was a, a growth of skepticism about this um, just overwhelming sort of um, solicitude to um, intellectual property rights holders, which basically means like Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the people who own mm -hmm. the intellectual property of songs, software, etc. There was this um, the SOPA law that happened that, that was proposed in the U.S. and there was like a reaction to that. SOPA or the Stop Online Piracy Act was proposed in the early 2010s, um, and it would have introduced like some pretty like draconian like penalties for people sharing content online. And it was quite notable, I think, in the sense that there was kind of a furor and um, like a, 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 a mess of like noise where people actually like fought against it. Um, so it was like there was a consumer or a citizen revolt against it. Tech companies also didn't really like it. So there, that there was the beginning of a response to laws like that. So what's my view of the future? But I am not sanguine that we will see many more copyright exceptions. The, the tide is flowing very much in favor of maximizing content, maximizing copyright protections, cutting down on exceptions, imposing liabilities on intermediaries. Um, and that's going to make life very difficult for end users who take advantage of exceptions and rely on intermediaries. Um, and I don't see that trend changing anytime soon, sadly. Publishers come and go, right? Or they get merged or delete things. Everything goes out of print. You know, they just, people are, they're, they're looking to do the next thing. That's the right thing for them to do. That's why we have libraries. So libraries go and, and make uh, copies of these materials into their collections, um, digital world or, or in the physical world. We just bought the physical things and then had them in our uh, collections. And then uh, we can make them reliably available. A business model that I like a lot are the libraries. Libraries um, uh, in the United States are $12 billion a year industry. And as I, I understand it, three to $4 billion goes to publishers' products. This is an old statistic from a couple decades ago, so it's probably much more than that. It's maybe 20% of the whole trade uh, book industry. And that is, in some sense, a distributed, socialized support system for core literature. It's often the thing that sort of keeps a lot of publishers uh, alive is library spending. When the pandemic hit and um, on Friday, um, is the Americans got uh, uh, sent home from schools and they were told they're not coming back. So, and teachers panicked. I was like, how are they going to get their schoolwork done come Monday? And so we started getting panicked calls from people as to what it is that should happen here. And so we asked libraries if they would sign on to an, an emergency measure that would run for 14 weeks um, to go and make uh, these books available. And so it worked. Um, and you know, it was to run for 14 uh, weeks and the publishers sued. Um, and they sued really not so much based on National Emergency Library. It's just lending at all. And they sued about 127 books. That was the, their, their, and the, what their demand is, is because there's these 127 books, they want us to destroy 1.3 million digital books. So they are, it's outrageous. Um, so they, they say there's 127, which we took down right away. And, and if any authors went and told us to take things down, we just took them down. 
Um, and we took those down uh, right right away. But there were, you know, popular readers that, you know, the Lord of the Flies, you know, things that, you know, kids actually could really use. But I guess the heirs, well, anyway. Um, so the publisher sued about 127 books, but they want us to destroy 1.3 million books. Be and um, And it's about lending in general. But um, so this program was to go for 14 weeks. We cut it short by two weeks, so it ran for 12 weeks. Um, but the lawsuit continues, and it'll continue for years and cost millions and millions of dollars. If you've ever tried to, to access an ebook through a public library, waiting lines, um, not having the book available when you want it, having an ebook disappear from your device if you didn't get to read it in full by the, the due date, um, those are some of the frustrations that users have had. For libraries, the problem has been that ebooks have made it impossible for them to do what they're supposed to do, to service their communities, to make books available to people in their communities. So I completely sympathize with the Internet Archive. I think their argument is well made. And this was uh, an unprecedented time, certainly in my lifetime, what we've been through as a society globally for the past year and a half. I still think that, you know, the strongest interests um, have the capacity to uh, um, defeat um, changes that are plainly in the public good. And, and so that's the reason to say that this, the fight that I left the field of copyright to take up is still a fight that um, um, we should be undertaking. You know, and we're going to see, obviously, um, one of my heroes in this movement um, um, is Brewster Kale. Uh, and Brewster's uh, Internet Archive is under significant threat from legal, from litigation um, that I imagine, I think this this fall is actually proceeding, but um, that will be an important test because, uh, you know, obviously my view of the archive is that it, it fills an extraordinarily important hole in the basic ecology of the information of the Internet to make sure that we have access to our past and can preserve and, and sustain access to culture that um, is typically not commercially available and um, and, to and to create a kind of digital version of libraries that makes it so that we can have access to printed works, not printed, but, you know, at least fairly the way you would if you went to a library. All of these functions of, um, of Brewster's archive have been, inc have become incredibly important parts of the internet. And if the courts shut them down, um, and even worse, you know, punish Brewster significantly for them, then I think we will have suffered an enormous loss. But, but um, you know, all, all fingers are crossed to see that maybe something sensible will happen here. Well, copyright has actually been sort of twisted into these life plus 50, life plus 70. I mean, why do you need to ins um, give extra incentive to dead authors? I, it's it, it's nuts. It has just um, been warped around by these large corporations and their lobbyists. So that's not good. But they've even gone further and they say, well, copyright isn't enough for us. We need to have everything licensed. There has been a push to extend the period of copyright protection. Um, as I said, it started out as seven plus seven. It's now life of the author plus 17 years. The last big push to extend copyright uh, was uh, successful in 1998 in the US, where effectively legislation championed by Sonny Bono um, created an extended copyright for Mickey Mouse. Um, so that Mickey Mouse has only just uh, recently dropped out of copyright protection, but um, uh, they, Mickey Mouse got an extra 20 years in 1998. Uh, and the, uh, the US, whenever it negotiates uh, an international treaty covering uh, content services, um, pretty much insists on ensuring that the copyright term of the reciprocal state is extended in the same way, which is one of the reasons why the EU extended its copyright protection in 2000 and why Canada is about to extend its from Life of the Author Plus 50 to Life of the Author Plus 70. What we found is that the books were significantly less available and more expensive in the US and Australia, which is where the terms are Life Plus 70, than in Canada and New Zealand where they were Life Plus 50. So what that suggested to us, and, and you know, we'd controlled for other factors, and what that suggested 
was that that longer copyright term was actually getting in the way um, of the books being available. But maybe, you know, for me, maybe the, the most startling thing that we found was that so many really important books were missing from all of those markets, regardless of the copyright status. Um, and that says that these books are depreciating um, long before um, the copyright terms actually expire. Um, and look, we simply can't afford to lose that culture. And so getting reversion rights will both help make creators um, be able to make more money, which is really, really important, but it will also simultaneously help us uh, reclaim a lot of the culture that's lost under current approaches to copyright if we were to get it right. I would love to see the length of copyright roll back quite a bit in a perfect world. You know, I think back in 1975, when the length of copyright was 56 years from the date of publication, um, was a pretty good standard. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe even less than, I don't know, but it was like at least reasonable. Now it's the life of the author plus 70 years, I think. Seven. In um, Europe at least, so, yeah. In the US, I think as well. Yeah. Um, or And then like, if it's a corporation, it's a different amount of time. But like, basically you will never see something come into the public domain that was produced in your lifetime. Like this, that, I would love to see that rolled back. Once one lawyer told me, well, if you kill copyright, you are killing the culture, like assuming that it's the same thing. <laughs> and that's kind of weird. That's a kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it's it's creepy sometimes <laughs> because <laughs> uh, you need the copyright definitely to create an ambience, to create an environment for promoting creation. But it's not creation itself. Creation and authorships uh, born even before copyright laws. Uh, you have culture many millennia before copyright. Mm -hmm. Copyright only created, it was created in one specific moment, in that one specific country for a specific purposes, and it was created in a pre-industrial era. So you are trying to impose criteria from the 17th century pre-industrial era to internet era. So it's kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, anachronic and even archaic to impose that kind of criteria. It became clear to me that the, that the architecture um, originally made it very hard to defend the property interest in intellectual property, but that that architecture would be changed. And as it was changed, my fear was that certain values Im embedded in intellectual property the value of fair use or limited protection or limited uh, time during which the copyrighted work would be protected could be overridden by the evolving technologies that would enable the purported owner to control the copyright. So this was a struggle about which values the internet should be sustaining, those of perfect control or those of access to creative works. And, and we were trying to build an architecture that would preserve access to these creative works. The copyright laws are not being created in um, a multi-stakeholders point of view, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything it's it's biased to the industry. Everything is biased to the commercial point of view. Everything is thought that every object of culture, every book, every piece of music uh, is um, it's going to be have a cost for every person. There are not the assumption that there are people that want to share freely, that they want, uh, that they want to, to share without any cost. And it, that's happening in the internet. People is sharing. People is giving their, uh, their mm -hmm. products with any cost, with any barrier, with any limitation for the great public in the internet. But the legislation is assuming that it doesn't happen. It's forgotten that the internet exists. When you go on you know, vacation to Paris and take a photograph in front of the Eiffel Tower during the day and it's fine, freedom of panorama, um, you have that right because the IP of the Eiffel Tower is in the public domain. But then if you take a photo at night, you've got the images of the light show that has been added to the, the tower in the last few decades. And so because the IP of that light show still re is retained by um, 
by the artist or, or the, um, the benefactor, I suppose, um, that then is not some, that, that is not subject to freedom of panorama because that IP is still an active form of IP. Mm -hmm.